Today we will have our lecture review of the Autonomous Power Operation Topic. Okay, so this is an advanced topic on the features of the protection processor architecture. Okay, these are some of the features. In fact, these are the main features of the protection processor architecture. Uh, sorry, ah. Uh. Okay, I increased the volume of my mic. Right, so um, today we're going to review the materials for ultra low power operation. These are the main features uh, of the Cortex M processor that supports low power operation. There, there are many other features of the Cortex M processor that supports low power operation, uh, but these are the main features. And in fact, uh, one of the main reasons why people use Cortex uh, processors, ARM Cortex processors, uh, is because of their low power and performance. Okay? It's, it's still being able to deliver high performance, uh, although it has one of the lowest power, uh, comparably the lowest power consumption in the market. <clears throat> so uh, these are one of the, these are four of the main features uh, for low power operation of Cortex M processes. So we look at them one by one, right? Uh, but before that, let me take your attendance. Okay, uh, Brenda, Brenda, are you here? Afternoon, uh, Chen Supian. Chen Supian, right? Chia Chai Siu, Chia Chai Siu, okay, Chu Zhang Hing. Chu Zhang Hing, Chu Zhang Hing, Chua Yu Yang, right. uh, Ernest, Ernest, Go Kian Sing, Fu Hing Dong, Fu Hing Dong, Fu Hing Dong, Ku Bun Kiong, Ku Bun Kiong, right. uh, Lao Lok Jing, Lao Lok Jing, okay. Li Zhe Lin, right. Lim Chun Wei, Lim Chun Wei, uh, Lim Wen Yang, Lim Yong Chuan, Long Yao Ting, Good afternoon. Uh, Lo Tiong Lia. Okay. Lu Ju Min. Right. Ng Han Xiang. Ng Han Xiang. Ng Wei Hong. Ng Wei Hong. Ong Mei Lin. Right. Uh, Pong Sui Wen. Pong Sui Wen. Kua Yi Hang. Kua Yi Hang. Uh, so Yen Cheng. Han Xin Shen. Han Xin Shen. Tio Liang Ho. Tio Yi Si. Tio Yi Si. Wong Chong Yi, Wong Ka Sing, Yong Wing Liang, Yong Chi Ye. Okay. Uh, Tio Yi Si, are you here? Tio Yi Si, Tio Yi Si, Hong Shui Wen, Hong Shui Wen, are you here? Hong Shui Wen, Fu Hing Dong, Fu Hing Dong, and uh, Chu Zhang Hing, Chu Zhang Hing. Okay. Uh, I'll check again later. Right. Um, okay, before that, uh, uh, have everyone submitted your quiz already? Okay, quiz 10, fine. Quiz 11 is okay. All right, quiz 12, quiz 12. Okay, uh, if you haven't uh, pressed the turning button, uh, quiz 12, uh, quiz 12, press the turning button, okay? Make sure you submit quiz 12. Uh. The due date was yesterday, okay? All right, back to the class. So let's look at uh, ultra low power operation. Now, um, the first feature, uh, the first feature is WFE and WFI. Wait for interrupts and wait for events. So, uh, what is this WFE and WFI for? What is this uh, WFE and WFI for? It's actually uh, to wake up our processor. The the main uh, low power operation uh, is we put the processor to sleep. What do we mean by putting the processor to sleep? We cut off the clock signal to most of the uh, circuits inside your microcontroller. Okay, we put the we put the whole system to sleep, right? We power down by putting the whole system to sleep. What we mean by putting the whole system to sleep is uh, we cut off the clock signal and the power supplier uh, to parts of the system so that that don't consume power. Okay, so how many sleep modes do we have? We have uh, this, um, we have three different types of sleep mode, three different types. Now, this is the power profile, relatively, uh, relatively. this is just a conceptual sketch. Uh. So the upper part here is the dynamic current. Dynamic current means of uh, the power that you use when you are switching your transistors. Because we have logic circuit. Logic circuits uh, will only uh, do something 
when you have a positive going transition or a negative going transition on your clock signal. Okay, as you know, like last time you did you design your sequential logic circuits, uh, you know your timer circuits, right? Nothing happens if there is no clock signal. So you either make the system respond to a, a positive going transition on your clock signal or a negative going transition. So when there is any transition, uh, uh, you will have a lot of switching going on. Some transistors will turn on, some transistors will turn off. And it is the switching that consumes power, right? You, you learn about CMOS transistors. You know that a CMOS transistors, they consume very little power because when they are not switching, uh, you only lose power through leakage, reverse current, which is very tiny. Uh. You only consume power at the moment that you switch. Okay, so uh, that is why uh, the more frequent you switch, the more power you consume. That's why dynamic current is proportional to clock frequency. So if your clock frequency is 100 megahertz, that means you're switching 1 million times per second. You're doing much more than 10 megahertz, switching 10 million times per second. Okay, so that's your dynamic current. Now, when you go to sleep mode, uh, most of the clock signals is stopped. That means a lot of the circuits in your microcontroller, right, don't receive clock signals anymore. So they stop operating. And your processor also, most of it doesn't receive clock signals anymore. You block the clock signals. Okay, so your immediately your dynamic current uh, reduces uh, drastically. So this is just a, a picture. Uh, actually, it should be uh, 1000 times less. Okay, uh, dynamic current versus sleep mode now uh, you should be consuming 1000 times less current okay so we don't change the voltage uh. as you know power p is equals to iv power is current times voltage your voltage is fixed 3.3 volts fixed so it's the current that's changing when the current change uh, the power consumption will change uh. okay so what stays the same uh, you notice uh, the thing that stays the same is the static current why the static current is the same uh? because static current uh, comes from leakage that means uh, even when you have zero clock frequency, totally no clock frequency, and nothing is moving, no? the leakage current will still be going on. Leakage current means all your transistors are actually PN junctions. So current is supposed to flow from P to N, one, one direction. But actually, uh, you have a very, very small leakage current in pico amps, maybe. Right? Pico is 10 to the power of minus 12 amps, flowing from N to P, reverse direction. You might say pico amps is very small, right? But imagine no, if you have a few hundred million transistors in your circuit, no, every transistor is leaking. So you add them together, accumulated, no, you will have a bit of uh, static current consumption. Even though you are doing nothing, the whole system is sleeping. You are still losing some current, no, static current. Okay, So that current is the same here. Now, when you go to deep sleep, no, Deep sleep is when you totally stop all clock signals. So when you totally stop all clock signals, uh, everything shut down, nothing is moving, you still consume static current. But then here's the question. If we totally stop all clock signals, right, then how do you wake up again? Because the microcontroller wakes up uh, through interrupts. You have to send an interrupt signal to the microcontroller to wake it up. So you need something to detect the interrupt signal coming in. That is your NVIC, uh, nested vector uh, interrupt controller. So only a small part of your processor is running. Uh, that's your NVIC here. So your NVIC is running. When it detects an uh, interrupt, uh, it will wake up the system. But when you stop all clock signals, uh, even the NVIC stop running, uh, then how do you wake up? Okay, so we have this special circuit uh, called the WIC. WIC, the wake up interrupt controller. Where is the WIC? Eh? So the WIC, eh, the wake up interrupt controller, eh, looks like this. Okay. It is outside your processor. It's optional. So the, the microcontroller vendor eh, may decide to implement the WIC or not. It, this depends on the system designer. Eh. Okay. So if they want to give you a uh, deep sleep mode, eh, then they have to put in the WIC. Why? Eh? Because in deep sleep mode, the whole processor and NVIC shut down. Okay, so they don't detect interrupts coming. So who is the, doing the job of detecting interrupts? It is the WIC. Okay, so what happens here is, this is the sequence of actions. Uh. Okay, let's look at this. Uh. This is the sequence of actions. Okay. First of all, 
your program enables the WIC. So you have to configure this guy. Uh, this is also another peripheral. You must configure one. So once you configure the WIC already, okay, he's working already. Uh, and this is microcontroller dependent. You have to check the data sheet on how to program different microcontrollers WIC. Okay. So now, once you en enable the WIC already, you enter a uh, deep sleep mode. How do you enter deep sleep mode? You use the WFE or WFI instruction. Wait for interrupt or wait for event instruction. So when you execute one of these two instructions or either one of them, uh, the processor will go into sleep mode. You can choose between deep sleep and normal sleep uh, using the system control register. Remember uh, your system control block, uh, there is a system control register and inside the system control register, you have this sleep deep, deep, sleep deep. Okay, so you can choose go into normal sleep or deep sleep. Lah. So if you choose to go into deep sleep, lah, right, then uh, what happens is the interrupt mask will be copied to the WIC. Interrupt mask means oh, inside your NVIC, you got some uh, settings uh, for which interrupt is enabled, which interrupt is disabled. So the interrupts that are disabled uh, will obviously not wake up the processor, right? You only want the interrupts that are enabled to wake up the processor. So the interrupt mask means uh, the interrupts which are enabled. Uh, okay? So the settings from the NVIC, uh, they will be copied to the WIC. So the WI, so it's like the NVIC is telling the WIC. NVIC is telling WIC. Okay, uh, if these interrupts come along, uh, wake me up. If it's not these interrupts, don't wake me up. Uh. Okay, so the WIC gets the interrupt mask ready. And then the power management unit, uh, this is your power management circuit. It will put the processor into a state retention power down sleep. What is a state retention power down sleep? Okay, state retention power down sleep uh, is a special circuit. Uh, it, we call it S, SRPG. Uh, SRPG. What's SRPG? Uh? Now you look at this diagram here. Uh, okay, look at this diagram. Uh, this is your uh, memory element, B flip flop. This is your memory. Okay, what's a register? A register uh, is actually uh, a collection of B flip flops. If you have a 32 bit register, right? If you have a 32 bit register, uh, it's actually a uh, 32 D flip flops. Each D flip flop holds one bit. When you put a logic one uh, to a D flip flop and you clock it, uh, it will hold that one bit at its output. You will hold it there until you change it. Uh, you load the new value into the this D flip flop. Uh. So if you string together uh, 32 D flip flops, uh, you get a 32 bit register. Uh. Okay. All right. So uh, this D flip flop here, okay, you need you have some combina combinatorial logic uh, before uh, at the input and some combinatorial logic at the output here on both sides. Okay, this is to because if you have some digital input coming in, you need to do some processing before you save it into the flip flop. Uh. And then the flip flop, uh, the output, uh, you probably have some digital processing before you send it to the next stage. Uh. So we have logic circuits in between here. Okay. And because your microcontroller is very, very big, imagine that uh, if you are an electron, uh, if you are an electron, you live in the microcontroller, uh, the microcontroller is like your planet Earth. Okay. So the whole microcontroller uh, is like an entire planet. You are one electron living in this planet. So when this electron travels around the whole planet, when you travel around the Earth, uh, it's like the electron travels around the microcontroller. It's very far, you know. So as the electron travels, uh, it's going to lose energy. It's going to lose energy. Your signal uh, will lose energy. What do we mean by losing energy? Energy uh, is voltage. Okay, Voltage is energy. What's the physical measurement for voltage? Joule per coulomb. Voltage, uh, the physical quantity is joule per coulomb of charge. So if I have one coulomb of charge, this one coulomb of charge is just a certain number of charge. Uh, right? A certain number of charge. Uh, that means a certain number of electrons. Uh, they will carry a certain number of energy in joules. As they travel, uh, they will lose energy. Why? Uh? Because it is the energy that pushes the electrons to move. Electrons move because of potential difference, difference in energy level. Electrons move from a position of higher energy to a position of lower energy. So when they move, uh, obviously, uh, they will lose energy. So that's why we need clock buffers. Uh. Clock buffers, right, push them back up, increases back up their energy so they can travel very far. And the clock network, uh, 
the clock network spans your entire microcontroller. Everything in your microcontroller is synchronized to the processor clock. So the clock network uh, spans your entire microcontroller. So you need a lot of clock buffers because this clock network uh, spreads through your entire microcontroller. Okay. <clears throat> right. So uh, everything needs power. The clock buffer needs power. So you see this red color line, uh, this is the power. Clock buffer needs power. Combinatorial logic needs power. Your D flip flop needs power. Combinatorial logic needs power. Everything needs power. So if I supply power to everything here, uh, you will have leakage. You see, if I supply power here, you have a leakage path to ground. I supply power here, you have a leakage path to ground. I supply power to this one, you have a leakage path to ground. Supply power here, you have a leakage path to ground. So all of these uh, contributes to static current usage, leakage. So how do I reduce this leakage? I can, instead of connecting all this red color power supply rail, uh, instead of connecting it to VCC, uh, I connect it to a power gate. A power gate uh, is basically, uh, a power gate is just a logic gate. <clears throat> a power gate uh, is just a logic gate. Why do we call it a gate? Leh? Because uh, it is really a gate. What's a gate? Logic gate. Leh? Right? See, this is your end gate, right? This is your end gate. Uh. Okay, this is your end gate. Okay, so if I got here, uh, this is a power or a signal. Uh. Okay, if I put a one here, uh, then uh, you can pass. Right? You can pass. But if I put a uh, if I put a zero here, if I put a if I put a zero here, then cannot pass. Output will always be zero. End gate, man. If one of the input is zero, output is always zero. End gate, right? If the one of the input is one, uh, then the output, uh, if this input, if input one is uh, one, uh, then your output uh, will follow input two. So we use this concept uh, for gating. We use this concept for gating. So the power control from the power management unit, uh, the power management unit. So if the PMU uh, puts a one here, uh, power can pass through. If the PMU puts a zero here, then you got no power. When you got no power, uh, no power coming through here, you got zero leakage. So that's how we reduce the. That's how uh, we reduce the leakage. So if I cut, if I put a zero here. I cut off this entire power, then not everything will turn off. But if everything turn off, or including the D flip flop turn off, or then I'm going to lose my memory. If you lose memory, or how do you resume? Your, your system go to sleep. You shut off everything. Uh, you cannot start back again because you lost the memory already. Okay? It's like when you go to sleep, uh, your whole body will hibernate, uh, go into low power, uh, but your brain uh, is still running. Your brain continuously runs uh, 365 days a year for your entire life. And even when you're sleeping, your brain is running. If your brain shut down, uh, then when you wake up, uh, you become a different person. Right? Yeah. You have no memories of who you were yesterday. Right? So in order for the program to resume, uh, we need the deep flip flop to retain its previous state, logic 1 or logic 0, retain its state. Okay? That's why uh, we add a special logic circuit, not we. Uh, the system designer added a special circuit here called the state retention element. It's a very, very low power circuit that holds the, retains the uh, memory, retains the value or the logic state held by this D flip flop. Okay. And of course, it needs to be permanently powered. Uh. That's why this state retention element, uh, it's permanently powered. Okay. So you can shut down most of the system, uh, but when you wake up, uh, you will still be able to resume operation correctly because the memory is retained but using a very, very small piece of circuit. Okay, all right. So that's, this is called state retention power gating. This method, state retention power gating, SRPG. Okay, so uh, coming back here. Now, um, okay. So uh, uh, the power management unit, puts the processor to sleep and then it enables the SRPG, all right? So everything is sleeping now already. Processor is in a power down uh, state. Okay, sleeping, huh? All right, then what happens is number six, an interrupt comes along, interrupt comes along. So you got two types of interrupt. 
your normal interrupt, all your normal interrupts from microcontroller peripherals, and the special NMI, non-maskable interrupt. NMI is special, uh, it's non-maskable because uh, it cannot be disabled. Normal interrupts, uh, you can disable them or enable them, uh, but non-maskable interrupt cannot be disabled, and that's why they are separated. Uh, we got two types of interrupts. Uh. Okay, so these two interrupts, uh, they will come, they will go to your NVIC, but as you know, uh, NVIC is sleeping, uh, so the NVIC won't detect this. This is an OR gate. Uh. OR gate, if it's a one, you just pass through one. Uh, pass through, but the NVIC won't detect this. Now this, at the same time, it has a parallel path to the WIC. So when the WIC detects the interrupts coming up, uh, check with the interrupt mask to see if they are uh, enabled. Okay, if they are enabled, then the WIC uh, will send a wake up signal to the PMU. It will send a wake up signal to the PMU, tell the PMU to restore power to the processor. Now, during this time, uh, if the interrupts is a pulse, okay, if the interrupts is a pulse, uh, the pulse will come and go already, right? So now the pulse is gone. So even if you wake up the NVIC, uh, the NVIC won't see the interrupt anymore. Right? Uh, that's why uh, the WIC uh, will hold the interrupt request. So you see, the interrupt comes here, goes in. The WIC detects the interrupt, right? It will then uh, duplicate the interrupt and send it back out here. Send it back out. So even if the original interrupt signal is no longer there anymore, it's gone, uh, the WIC is holding the interrupt request active here. Okay, it's holding the interrupt request active to the processor okay, until the processor wakes up. Now, it will take some time. Uh, it will take some time, maybe some microseconds uh, right, for the PMU to wake up the processor, start up the processor. Why you need some time? Uh, because everything also got capacitive effect. Uh, you want to turn on something from zero to three point three volts, uh, you need some time for it to charge. Right? Everything has capacitive effect. And that capacitive effect uh, means nanoseconds or microseconds. Uh. So you have to wait for the processor to wake up. Okay. And then once the processor wake up already, uh, then you start processing, go to the interrupt series routine and deal with the interrupt. Okay. So this is the this is what the WIC does. Uh. Right, this is the WIC. Wake up interrupt control. Okay. Back to page one. Okay, so we talked about the WIC already, right? So now let's look look at this. Um, <clears throat> go back to this diagram. Huh? So just now we were talking about uh, all clock signals were stopped, right? If you stop all the clock signals already, then processor cannot detect interrupt coming right now. That's where the WIC comes in, right? But you see, uh, your static current is still the same. Huh? But if you employ state retention power gating, uh, if you employ state retention power gating, we can drastically reduce the static current. See, the static current uh, is drastically reduced because we switch off all those paths that can cause leakage current and only keep the memory elements uh, active so that the system can resume. Uh. So you got your SRPG. Okay. And even if you totally power down your microcontroller or uh, you will still have leakage in your circuit. Uh. You know, uh, you power your microcontroller, your whole board microcontroller uh, with VDD and ground, right? Even if the microcontroller is turned off, uh, you will still have some leakage path uh, between VDD and ground one, unless you use a pure mechanical switch, right? If you use a purely mechanical switch, uh, mechanical switch uh, totally no contact uh, when it's off, uh, you've got zero, zero static current. Uh. But nowadays, uh, everyone is using uh, semiconductor switches. Semiconductor switches means uh, the switch is automatically controlled. Uh, you know, all your IoT devices, uh, they are all semiconductor switches. So as long as you're using a semiconductor switch, uh, even though you power down already, uh, you will still have very, very small amount of leakage through the semiconductor switch that turns back on the system. Okay, all right. So this is the power profile. Now. Let's look at the WFE and the WFI instruction. Okay. Oh, before that, uh, this is the uh, system control block SCR register. Okay. You have seen this register before. So this register, uh, uh, it has three bits, three bits that is of importance to us. Uh, the rest are not used. Huh? So we got the sleep deep bit. This bit is either zero or one. If zero, uh, when you go to sleep, it's normal sleep. If it's one, when you go to sleep, it will be a deep sleep. And if you select deep sleep, uh, 
make sure that you configure the WIC. Otherwise, uh, you won't wake up. Okay. All right. Now, uh, there is one more feature. There is another feature here called sleep on exit. What is sleep on exit for? Eh? If you enable sleep on exit, eh? if you enable this bit, eh? what happens is the processor goes to sleep automatically when it exits exception handler. Okay. This is very useful. When is this useful? Eh? When is sleep on exiting an exception handler useful? If uh, we can place all our code inside exception handlers. That means uh, in your main loop, uh, you got nothing there. All your processing uh, is inside interrupt service routines. So uh, when an interrupt happens, your processor wakes up, respond to the interrupt, and then when it exits the interrupt service routine, uh, it immediately go back to sleep. That's the sleep on exit feature. So what's the advantage of this? Okay, let's have a look at sleep on exit. Right. <clears throat> so uh, this is the stacking process. Now you look at this. Uh, what's the advantage? Uh? Okay, first, when you turn on the system, you power up, uh, you will have some initialization uh, okay, whatever hardware you're using. And then, and then you are going to execute WFI. When you execute WFI, wait for interrupt, your processor goes to sleep. Okay, make sure sleep on exit is enabled. Uh, you go to sleep. Okay, so now you are sleeping. So now you are inside the main loop. Uh, your main loop and you are sleeping. When an interrupt happens, interrupt comes along, you are going to stack. Because you are in your main loop. Uh, you are in the main loop. Uh, so you will do automatic stacking one time before you go to the IRQ handler to run the code in the IRQ handler. Now, but the special part is this. Once you finish running the interrupt service routine, uh, you don't unstack. Because you are not returning to the main loop. You are not returning to the main loop. When you finish the interrupt service routine or IRQ handler, uh, there is no unstacking because you immediately go back to sleep, sleep on exit feature. When you exit the interrupt service routine, you immediately go back to sleep, so no unstacking. And the advantage is this. The next time the interrupt happens, uh, when you wake up, uh, you don't need to stack again because you never unstack. Man. So you, you don't need to stack again. Immediately, you can execute the IRQ handler. Okay, and then when you exit the IRQ handler, you don't need to unstack again. And this is a, a lot of power saving because imagine no, every time you stack, you are moving 32 uh, bytes. Every time you unstack, you are moving 32 bytes. So for every stacking and unstacking processor, you are moving 64 bytes of data, 64 bytes of data. And you, you multiply this, uh, actually that's a considerable amount of energy saved. Uh. And not to also mention, uh, you are also re reducing the interrupt latency. Because when the interrupt happens, uh, you wake up and you immediately run the queue handler. You don't have to waste, uh, you don't have to waste 12 to 15 processor cycles uh, doing stacking. You don't have to waste processor cycles to do stacking. So you actually run get to your ISR handler faster. So lower latency, less delay. Okay. And the flow chart looks like this. The flow chart looks like this. Okay, this is the flow chart. <clears throat> so start a program, initialization. First, you enable the sleep on exit feature. What is this enable sleep on exit feature? Basically, yeah, you just set the sleep on exit bit in the system control register. You just go to the SCR register and set the sleep on exit bit. Okay, then you enable already. Then you execute the WFI to go to sleep, right? You enter sleep. Now, let's say here in this example, we've got three interrupt service routines. Uh, so anyone can wake you up. Uh. So when you wake up, uh, you will go and execute the corresponding ISR. And then when you exit, you go back to sleep. Okay, you act, when you exit, uh, you go back to sleep. Okay, so uh, we, we need a loop here. This loop uh, is just in case uh, your processor wake up uh, because of some other things. Now, if you check the data sheet, uh, there are a few conditions that can wake up your processor. Interrupt is just one of them. Another way your processor can wake up uh, if you have a debugger. A debugger, uh, if you're debugging your microcontroller, uh, you've got a hardware debugger, uh, you can send a signal to wake up the processor. So if the processor wake up because of a debugger signal, uh, then uh, it will 
it will execute this, it will execute this, which is you're just, just basically putting a while one loop here. So you will look back and execute the WFI to go back to sleep. If you don't put this loop off, when your processor wake up because it's something other than an ISR, then you won't go back to sleep again. Right? So you have to put this loop in case uh, the processor wakes up because of some other condition. Then you look back and then go back to sleep again. Okay, all right. So now let's look at the WFE and WFI, the instructions that put the processor to sleep. What is the difference between WFE and WFI? Okay, let's have a look. Huh? Let's go back to page one. Let's have a look at WFE and WFI. <clears throat> okay, WFI uh, is wait for interrupt. WFE is wait for event. These are assembly instructions. These are assembly instructions. But obviously, you don't use assembly because you're writing C. Ma. So then we use the CMC's core functions provided to us, which is underscore underscore WFI and underscore underscore WFE. These are the CMC's functions for us to put the processor to sleep right, in C program. Now, what is the difference? Okay, the difference is this. Difference is this the wake up conditions. Let's look at WFI first, right? So there are, there are a few conditions uh, that we have to see. First of all is the interrupt priority and then the uh, priority mask. So we have to look at these two conditions. First of all, we have to see uh, is the interrupt priority higher than the current priority, okay? In order to wake up, uh, the interrupt priority must be higher than the current priority must be higher to wake up. So you see, if the interrupt priority is higher, then you wake up, yes. If the interrupt priority is equals or less than, you don't wake up, no, okay? Interrupt priority is higher, you wake up. Interrupt, prior, interrupt priority is equals to or lower, you don't wake up, okay? So now we know that, okay, if you wanna wake up, we look at priority. How about ISR execution? So yes, we wake up already, but do we execute the ISR handler? Then you have to look at the, this, uh, this register, this register. So this register, uh, zero means all interrupts are enabled. If all interrupts are enabled, then you execute the ISR, okay? If all interrupts are disabled, yes, you wake up, but you do not execute the ISR, okay? So, uh, these are the conditions that you look at the priority. If you go to sleep with WFI, uh, whether you wake up or not, and if you wake up, do you execute the ISR? Depends on the, in, the incoming interrupt priority and the priority mask register, priority masking register, okay? <clears throat> so this is uh, WFI, this is WFI. Uh. Now, how about WFE? Wait for event. So. An interrupt uh, is an event. <clears throat> an interrupt is an event. So let's see uh, what are considered events. <clears throat> what are considered as uh, events? So these are considered as events. Okay. WFE wake up events. Uh, WFE wake up events, right? Uh, are these. Okay. So you have an event register. When any of the events, when any of these events occur, the event register will be set to one. This, this event register is just a one bit, one bit internal register. So you have a special one bit internal register called the event register. It will record that an event has occurred. Okay, you will record that as an event has occurred. So what's it is an event. If you have an, an exception, entrance, or exit. Okay. If you enter an exception handler or you exit an exception handler. Right. And if uh, if an interrupt is pended, then if an interrupt is pended, this is not an event. Huh? A pending interrupt is only an event. Huh? If you set this bit, set event on interrupt pending. Okay, if an interrupt happens, uh, a pending interrupt, uh, an interrupt happens, uh, okay, it is not considered an event if this bit is not set. So you have to set this bit. 
to, to make a pending interrupt an event, set event on pending. Okay, so this bit is in your, uh, <clears throat> this register. This bit is here, this register. Okay, set event on uh, pending interrupt. Set event on pending interrupt. So when this bit is set to one, uh, the processor will wake up if you put it to sleep, WFE, if a new interrupt is pending. Okay. WFE means go to sleep, wake up if there is an event. If you set event on pending means an interrupt is considered as an event. So a new interrupt being pending uh, will wake up the processor if you put it to sleep using WFE. Okay. Regardless of uh, whether the interrupt has higher priority or not, or is enabled or not. Okay, it doesn't matter if the interrupt is enabled or its priority level. As long as an interrupt comes along and is pended, uh, the processor will wake up. If you put it to sleep with WFE and you set this bit to one. Okay, so set event on pending makes a pending interrupt considered as an event. Right. So that's uh, conditions, conditions, uh, conditions uh, uh, to wake up from WFE. So, okay, you have the segment pending. Then you also have external event signal, external event signal. Now, all your CPUs are, all your CPUs, right? All the Cortex-M CPUs are, they have a transmit event and a receive event pin. You can send, you can transmit an event signal or you can receive an event signal. Okay, how do you transmit an event signal? You execute the SEV instruction. This is, now you didn't learn this instruction because uh, you only use this uh, in a multi-processor system. Okay, microcontrollers, uh, microcontrollers, we don't have multi-processors. Microcontroller, Cortex-M, we don't have multi-processor, uh, not currently. Uh, maybe uh, soon now uh, we're going to have multi-processor Cortex-M microcontrollers, but now we don't have one. Multiprocessor system is normally for Cortex-A. Okay, your handphone or tablets, uh, you have multiple processors. So when you have multiple processors, uh, the processors uh, need to be able to communicate with each other. So inter-processor communication uh, is using this uh, transmit event and send event. Uh, sorry, transmit event and receive event. So when one processor transmit an event, uh, how you do that? You execute the SEV instruction. In CMC, it's underscore, underscore, SEV. So when you execute the SEV instruction, send event, no? a pulse will be generated on the TXEV pin, which will go to all the other microcontrollers. Huh? What's the purpose of this pulse? To wake them up. Okay? Because in a system with multiple processors, huh, you don't need all the processors to be running at the same time. Maybe just one processor is running. Okay, Let's say you've got two processors. Huh? So this processor is running. This processor is currently powered down, sleeping. Okay, it's WFE. This processor, WFE sleeping. <clears throat> so when this processor, he needs help, so it, you, you send the SEV, you execute SEV, so you send the si event signal, come up here through the OR gate, and then you go to this side. When this, this processor receives a signal, then it will wake up. Okay, receives a signal, wake up, which is one of your conditions, you can see here. Okay. External event signal on your RX EV pin. So if your CPU RX EV pin, uh, you receive an event signal coming from another CPU, uh, then you wake up, uh, right? Uh, and you also wake up uh, if you execute a S SEV instruction, uh, not wake up. This is this is uh, setting the one bit event register. So if you execute a SEV instruction, uh, you will set your one bit internal event register. Not wake up uh, because obviously you cannot execute the instruction if you're sleeping. Uh. Now you're not sleeping. Uh. When you execute this instruction, you set your one bit event register. Okay. And also if there is a debug event, uh, just now I was saying uh, something else that can wake up your processor if there is a debug event. Uh. Okay, for example, you know you're debugging your microcontroller, uh, debugging, uh, so you're pressing the step, 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 right? When you step, you execute one instruction, then the processor stops. When you press step, you execute one instruction, then the processor stops. Okay, so that's the debug event uh, or halting request. Halt, you stop the processor after you execute every one line of code. Okay, so now 
this event register, uh, one bit event register, uh, if you do any of these things, uh, you set the one bit event register. Uh, okay. Now, if you execute a WFE, uh, if there is an event in your event register, your event register is set to one, uh, you execute a WFE, uh, your processor won't go to sleep. It will clear the this one bit event register and it will continue execution. Okay. If your event register is set because of any one of these, uh, then uh, when you execute WFE, the processor will just clear the event register and continue execution. It don't go to sleep. But if your event register is cleared, internally is zero, uh, when you execute WFE, the processor will go to sleep and wake up if any of these conditions, one, two, three, and five happens. Uh. Okay. All right, so that's the purpose of the. This is the this how WFE and WFI works lah. Okay, now lastly, yeah, lastly, yeah, there is one more feature used in. There is one more feature used in uh, uh, for power saving, and that is called the exclusive operations. Exclusive operations. So we talk about SEV already, yeah, same event. Now, exclusive operations or. Is a special feature of uh, Cortex M3, M4, and upwards processors. Uh. They are used to support operating system. Uh. You know, when you use your operating system, uh, your RTOS, uh, you got semaphore, right? You got semaphore. Uh. So, what does the semaphore do? The semaphore ensures that when you access, when you access a shared resource, uh, only one thread can use the shared resource at any one time. So if somebody is using the shared resource, other others cannot use it. Uh. You say exclusive. Uh. So the if somebody has gained exclusive access to the shared resource, only that person can use that, that resource. Uh. Nobody else can use it uh, until that person finished using and he released the resource. Okay. So how do we pro how do we enforce exclusive operation? Software method is using semaphore. Semaphore is a software method. Uh. So we also need hardware support for to enforce exclusive operation. So the hardware support uh, provided, right? The hardware support uh, provided by ARM version 7 M architecture. Now, Cortex M0 and M1 is version 6 architecture. Cortex M3, M4 upwards, uh, M3, M4, M7, uh, they are version 7 architecture. So they have an additional instruction. Uh, uh, you haven't seen this before because it's not part of version 6M architecture. So this instruction uh, is called exclusive access instruction. You got your normal access instruction, LDR, ST, LDR, LDRH, STR, SDRH, STRB, LDRB. Those are your normal one, right? Now the exclusive one, uh, what's the difference? What's the difference? You got your EX there, LDR. Instead of LDRB, you got LDR EXB. Instead of LDRH, you got LDR EXH. Instead of LDR, you got LDR EX. Okay, so these are exclusive access. Now, what was so special about exclusive access? Uh? Now, the special thing of exclusive access, uh, the idea is like this. The idea is uh is like this. Let, let me sketch it out. Uh. Draw it here. The idea is uh like this. Okay, so uh, let's say I got, uh, this is memory and this is address. Okay, this is memory. This memory, dot, dot, dot. This memory, dot, dot, dot. And this address, uh, so I got address A, B, C, and D. Okay, now, exclusive access uh, is only used uh, if you have multi-processor system. That's why uh, we don't stress on this much uh, because again, microcontrollers don't have multiprocessor, but soon there will become a time when you have multiprocessors. Uh, and also if you're doing Cortex A, uh, you will have multiprocessor. So what do we mean by multiprocessor? All right, now I got CPU one. I got CPU two. Okay, I got CPU one and CPU two. Okay, uh, this is, a, B, A, uh, why? Uh, because this is now uh, this is uh, this is one byte. This is one 
So this is a 34 byte variable, 32 bits. So this is a <coughs> UINT32 underscore T. This is four bytes. These four bytes are. Huh? So now, <coughs> when when CPU one, uh, when CPU one accesses this variable, CPU one wants to modify this variable. So CPU one reads a, modify it, modify the value, and then write it back. Okay. CPU one uh, reads these four bytes, and because it's four bytes, oh, so you might not read it at one go. You might not finish the whole process in one cycle. So CPU one will read the value, and then internally it will modify the value, maybe add something to it or minus something, do something, and then it will write it back. So as you can see, uh, this whole, whole operation is multiple cycles. So while CPU one is doing this, oh, what if another CPU comes and accesses the same variable at the same time. If you have two CPUs uh, modifying the same variable at the same time, what will happen to this variable? You will become garbage already. Okay, you will become garbage because uh, you imagine uh, a four byte value uh, being modified by two CPUs. So the four bytes are uh, you might have one or two bytes coming from CPU one, another one or two bytes coming from CPU two. So the whole value here will become corrupted already. Lah. So how to make sure that uh, only one CPU can access this at one time? Ah, so now uh, we put a special thing. This special thing uh, is called, uh, where is my, we have, we have a exclusive access tag. Exclusive access tag. Where is my word for the tag? Over here. ARM version 7M processors are uh, they have an exclusive access monitor. It's a special hardware circuit that will tag the memory location address with load exclusive. Okay, so when you use the load exclusive instruction, now you will tag the memory location address. Okay, so the idea is like this, ah. Huh? Okay. So CPU one, right? He will. Read the value. Now you don't use normal read. Huh? If you use normal read, right, then another processor might mess up what you're doing. Huh? So you use exclusive access read, LDREX. When you use LDREX, what happens? Something special happens. This whole location, huh? this whole value huh, will be tagged. It will be. When you use LDREX, this addresser will be tagged. What's the purpose of tagging? So uh, when another CPU or when CPU2 uh, tries to LDREX or you try to LDREX, uh, it's already tagged. So CPU2 cannot do anything. You have to wait. Okay. So this CPU one, he LDR EX already, then he modify the stuff and then write it back. So when he STR EX, store exclusive, is a pair. If you do LDR EX, you will tag it. When you do STR EX, what happens? Once your store exclusive finish, you will untag it. Ah, when you untag it already, uh, then another CPU will try to do a load exclusive again. See, oh, no tag. Huh? Then now the other guy will. Okay, so now, so now CPU two will, CPU two will tag it. Uh, so now, CPU two has access to these four bytes, and then you can do whatever you want. Then once he, once he store exclusive, then the tag will be removed. So this is hardware. This is done by hardware. Uh. This is done by hardware. You have a special, you have a special. Hardware circuit called the access monitor. It will it will act, it will monitor anybody who tries to access the same memory location. So if you got two CPUs trying to access the same memory location using load exclusive, uh, then the first one will get to access the second one. will have to uh, step back and wait. Uh. Okay. Okay. So that's the that's the idea of this uh, multi-processor communication. Okay. The reason for multiprocessor communication. So, 
how does this uh, multiprocessor communication interface reduce power so that so uh, you don't have to keep checking uh, you don't have to keep checking right you don't have to keep checking you can use uh, interrupts so the processor can then just if the if there are multiple processors are uh, trying to access the resource uh, one processor gain the other processor just power down and wait uh, you wait until this processor finish, uh, then this processor once done, uh, you will send the event signal and tell the other processor, okay, I'm done, time for your turn. So that processor will then wake up and then uh, resume. Uh. Right. So this is how we save power by powering down one processor uh, if another processor is uh, using the resource that this processor needs. So we just power down the wait until the resource becomes available. Uh. Okay. All right, and that's, that's all. Uh. These, these are just some applications uh, of the event communication interface. Yeah, pretty straightforward, so you can go through this. Okay, so now let's look at, let's look at uh, quiz first. Now, quiz 10. Uh, last week, we haven't done quiz 10 yet, uh, so let's look at the operating system support quiz 10. Okay, right, first of all, um, how does the memory protection unit guarantee immediate detection of stack overflow? Memory protection unit. No, stack stack overflow. Uh, stack overflow uh, can be detected using your overflow protect pattern, but the overflow protect pattern uh, doesn't guarantee immediate uh, detection one, because the operating system uh, only checks the overflow protect pattern uh, during thread switching. So when you're not switching between threads, uh, even though the the overflow happened, or uh, you don't immediately detect. So how memory support memory protection unit support uh, is you put the you put a read a no access region uh, you use your mpu and you program a no access region at the end of the stack so the moment uh, you got overflow you write into this no access region uh, then the memory management fault will immediately be triggered okay it's it's like this uh. remember this example uh. remember this example so uh, you got your you got your stack here uh. You got your stack here uh. so you use the mpu uh. you program here uh, at the end of the stack you know this your stack starts from here and grows downwards man. so you program a no access region you program a no access region using your mpu at the bottom so when you hit the end of the stack and then you overflow uh, into the no access region uh, immediately you will trigger a memory uh, management fault uh, mpu fault uh. Okay, so this is how you immediately detect uh, stack overflow. Okay, right, next one. Next one, huh? Uh, processor modes involved in task initialization of a basic operating system is shown. Okay, so here uh, I got a basic operating system. So, you know, normally when you initialize the system, normally uh, initialize, uh, you will initialize, you will start up the system in thread mode with full privilege thread mode with full privilege and then you execute the svc so you will go to handler mode and execute your operating system code and you also initialize your task line. okay then after that no, when you return from the exception no, you will return to unprivileged uh, thread mode okay you return to unprivileged thread mode so how is it that you can return to unprivileged thread mode that's because uh, the value of your link register. You know, when you return from an exception, you use the link register, the, the exception return code. The exception return code. You know, the inside your link register, uh, inside your, this is your uh, LR, your link register. So you put into the link register uh, the exception return code. What's the exception return code? The exception return code uh, is uh, 32 bits, but everything is F, uh, so F, 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 except for the last four bits here. So this last four bits, uh, is this one is fixed, zero, one. While these two bits uh, is, uh, this one is return with, if PSP is one, return with, uh, MSP would be, Return by unstacking from process stack pointer is one. If you unstack from main stack, main stack is zero. This one return to uh, thread is one. Return to 
handler mode is zero. Okay, so if you see here, we are we are returning to we are returning to track track mode. So we are returning to track mode, and we need to unstack with the process stack pointer. So this value would be one one zero one. One one zero one is D. Okay, so your whole value would be F F F F F F F D. Okay, so the the value of link register. Uh, uh, this link register value you load into the program counter. When you load the link register value into the program counter, how you do that? BXLR. BXLR will load. BXLR will load the program counter with the link register value. So this special exception return code, when you load it into the program counter, you will trigger. You will trigger the return mechanism. This code inside the link register. Uh, when you load it into the program counter using BXLR, uh, this is how you trigger the return mechanism from the ISR. Uh, okay. So when you trigger the return mechanism, uh, these two bits are important. We have to check these two bits because they control which stack you unstack from when you return and which mode you return to. So we are returning to track mode and we want to unstack from PSP. So it will be 1111. So which is what 1101 is D. So it's FFFD is the value. Okay. All right. Yeah. Right. Next one. Uh, what is the main advantage of using pen SV for context switching? Uh, this one we know lah. SVC, oh, if you if you do context switching with SVC. When you trigger the SVC, you have to do context switching immediately, right? But we know that uh, we should only do context switching after all other interrupts have been processed. So that is why we put context switching in pen SV and we give pen SV the lowest priority. So if we give pen SV the lowest priority, then pen SV will only run, uh, context switching will only run. Uh, after all other interrupts have been processed. So we ensure that the context switching only happen after all other interrupts have been processed. Okay, that's the, the purpose of pen SV. That's why it's called pendable supervisor call instead of using supervisor call. If you use SVC, uh, whatever you want to do must happen immediately. Uh, otherwise, you get a fault. Okay, pendable supervisor is for those things that you want to be delayed because you need to have all the interrupts processed First, okay, All right. Uh, that's and as we okay. Next one, which of the following does not involve process stack memory? So process stack memory is used to store uh, uh, automatic register stacking when an interrupt happens. Yes, local variable storage. Yes, uh, nested exceptions. No, okay. Because uh, you see ah. Uh, Right now, you are using the process stack. When an interrupt happens, yes, you automatically stack registers into the process stack the first time. Then uh, you will go to the interrupt service routine. When you are inside the interrupt service routine, uh, you will switch to using the main stack. You won't use process stack anymore. Uh. When, you are use when you are inside the interrupt service routine, you are using main stack, not process stack. So if there are any nested exceptions, uh, then the automatic register stacking will use the main stack already, not the process stack. Huh? So this is wrong. Huh? Okay. Uh, process stack is also used for uh, track contacts to store your track contacts before you switch. Right? Okay. Uh, why, why must we configure SysTick uh, with high priority when you're using an RTOS? We must configure SysTick with high priority when using RTOS uh, because uh, the SysTick handler must complete before the next tick. You know, in your operating system, uh, all timing is based on the SysTick handler. So if you if you program the SysTick handler to run every one millisecond, right? The SysTick handler must run every one millisecond. Okay. If you don't give SysTick high, high enough priority, uh, SysTick is preempted by other interrupts. Uh, those interrupts while they are running, uh, they prevent the SysTick handler 
from finishing before the next tick. Okay, so if the cystic handler don't finish before the next tick, uh, then your timing will be out already. Uh. So at the next tick, the cystic handler cannot run. So your timing will be out already. Okay, so cystic must be given sufficiently high priority uh, so that its handler can complete uh, before the next tick. Uh. So the next tick, then you will run again. Okay. Right. Then, uh, what is the main advantage of dynamic analysis over static analysis when you want to estimate the stack size? Dynamic analysis, uh, you do it by running the program. So you know the, you know the actual stack usage. Dynamic analysis uh, gives you the actual stack usage. Okay, but what's the disadvantage? Okay, disadvantage is uh, when you execute the program with dynamic analysis, you know the actual stack usage, but you don't know the worst case. Right. It's very difficult uh, to create worst case conditions when you are running the program. It happens very rare one. So it's very difficult to create those conditions uh, for worst case. But you will know the worst case, maximum ISR nesting, uh, the worst case uh, using static analysis. Okay. So main advantage of dynamic is you know the actual stack usage uh, when you are running, but you don't know the worst case. Uh. Okay. Uh, next one. Which is the least useful advantage of cystic? Okay, so we talk about what is the advantage of cystic uh, compared to other microcontroller timers. What is the advantage of cystic compared to other microcontroller timers? Precise core clock timing. This is not an advantage because uh, the other microcontroller timers and cystic they have the same precision. Right? Cystic is not more precise than other hardware timers. Uh, they are the same. But the advantage of cystic is because cystic is inside the processor, so you need privileged access. Okay, it has a built-in security feature, and because cystic uh, is available on all Cortex M processors, right, regardless of microcontroller, whether LPC one seven six eight or STM thirty two F, they all also have cystic. So if you write your code to run on cystic, uh, you can easily port your software between microcontrollers. Okay, if you use your code, if you write your code using cystic. You can run the code on LPC1768. You can run your code on STM32F because both also got cystic, right? Facilitate software porting. And also, uh, you will notice that uh, the cystic timer is much, much, much more simpler than your other microcontroller timers. Your other microcontroller timers, uh, they are very complicated because they have a lot of functions and they support a lot of uh, things in your microcontroller. For example, uh, your microcontroller serial port, PWM timing, no? everything, no? they need help from the timers. So the timer is very complicated one. But the cystic uh, is very simple. It is just used to generate periodic interrupts. Uh. That's why the cystic has much more lower power operation compared to the other timers because it's simple. Uh. Okay, so these are the advantages of cystic uh, compared to other microcontroller timers, right? except for position. Uh. They are both also same in position. Okay, last question. Uh, what is the role of R14? R14 is your link register. R14 uh, is your link register, LR. So what's the role of LR in context switching? Ah, just now we already know. Uh, we already know just now. Uh, LR, by, by manipulating LR, uh, you can choose to unstack from the process stack. Why, why we can unstack from the process stack? Right? Because uh, if you unstack from the process stack, uh, then you can, if you put the return address, you see, uh, you, you want to switch from one thread to another thread. You want to switch from thread A to thread B. Okay, so now I'm running thread A. How do I switch to thread B? If I, if I unstack from the process stack of thread B, uh, then not. Uh, I will unstack the program counter as well. So when I unstack the program counter in the process stack of stack B, right, then I will resume execution uh, from wherever that program counter is pointing to, which is to the next track. Uh, right? That's why I can do context switching. This is the, the key part of context switching. Right? To do context switching, uh, you need to unstack from the process stack used by the track that you want to switch to. 
then you will resume execution from the program counter of that track. So this is how we do contact switching. Okay, so and the key role is played by R14 link register. Okay, All right. So, uh, class, do you have any questions on uh, this quiz time or the uh, lecture materials for OSS last two weeks or the lecture materials for ultra low power today? Any questions? Uh, all okay? No questions? All okay? Do you have any questions on assignment two? You want to ask any questions on assignment two? No questions? Okay, so uh, if not, then we will stop here for today. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Oh, before that, uh, uh, let me check your attendance. Uh. Uh, Chu Zhang Hing, are you here? Chu Zhang Hing? Chu Zhang Hing, are you here? Chu Zhang Hing? Hu Hing Tong? Hu Hing Tong, are you here? Hu Hing Tong? Hu Hing Tong? Uh, Peng Shui Wen? Okay, Peng Shui Wen, right? Uh, Tio Yi Si, are you here? Okay, thanks. Uh. Okay, so uh, Hu Hing Tong, Chu Zhang Hing? Hu Hing Tong, Chu Zhang Hing. Hu Hing Tong, Chu Zhang Hing. Oh, here. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Oh, Hu Hing Tong is attending funeral. Okay. Thanks for notifying. Huh? So I'll just put here uh, leave. Attend relative funeral. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you.